city doesn't have any evidence of how the scene was staged. There's no blood anywhere else in the house. And no evidence on Dan. For the defendant, Daniel Howard, guilty or not guilty of second degree murder, guilty. The former state trooper is guilty of murder. Does he have a case, though, for appeal? Plus, the still-missing college student, Riley Strain, his last text message has been recovered. And defendant Karen Reed due in court today for a motions hearing. How might today tip the scales of justice at her homicide trial? It's all coming up next for you, plus much more right here on Opening Statements. Wednesday morning to you and welcome to opening statements. I'm your host, Julie Grant. It's great to have you along this morning. And if you're new to the program, just like in an actual trial, what we do on the show is get you all ready for the court day ahead. When people ask me what the show's like, I say it's like coffee in court. It's morning time. We get all warmed up and ready to go together. So right now, why don't you grab that cup of coffee? Because it's time for my opening statement. You know what's worse than a criminal? A dirty cop. At least with criminals, you know what you're going to get, right? But with a dirty, disgraced cop like Daniel Howard, they hide behind the badge and abuse their power. But now the show's over for him. It's done. The disgraced former state trooper is now a convicted killer. And not just any killer, his wife's killer. That's right, he murdered his beautiful estranged wife, Kendi, by strangling her to death. What kind of a man does that? I'll tell you what kind. A filthy, rotten scumbag. That's what kind. Men who beat their wives are pathetic. They're so insecure with themselves, they try to boost their own self-esteem by exerting power and control over their victims. They're also very manipulative people. Dan Howard, he's an operator. I thought so from the get-go, and I am so thrilled the jury thought so too. Now, off to prison he goes, where I am sure he will meet guys who are much tougher than him. Men who don't beat their wives. Men who find him despicable. And he won't have his badge or his gun to scare anybody in there. Instead, he will be the one running scared. I'll say this in close. I have no doubt that during the time that Dan Howard was on the police force, he used his position of power to frighten and control his wife, Kendi. Now, his power is gone. His name is Mud. And he better pray that God has mercy on his soul for killing the sweet, innocent woman who loved him for all those years. May Kendi Howard finally rest in peace. That's my opening statement on this Wednesday morning. Let me know if you like it. Right now, I want to give you what's on your daily docket. On the morning of January 27th, 2017, the defendant, Timothy Verrill, a paranoid drug dealer, trying to protect himself, his business, and his boss, brutally murdered Christine Sullivan and Jenna Pellegrini. All right, friends, here's a look at the cases we're following for you today on Court TV in New Hampshire. Testimony resumes at 10 a.m. in the Small Town Secrets murder case involving defendant Timothy Verrill. In Massachusetts, homicide defendant Karen Reed is due in court at 2 p.m. for a motions hearing. She's accused in the case involving her deceased boyfriend, police officer John O'Keefe. And then in Ohio, defendant Lisa Necrelli could be entering a guilty plea at 9 a.m. She is the woman who was caught on the ring doorbell video trying to entice a child who lived on her street. Right now, let's get you the very latest on the small town secrets murder case I want to bring in. My friend, Court TV crime and justice correspondent Matt Johnson in the studio this morning with the preview for us. Good morning, Matt. Hi, Julie. Good morning. Today is day two of testimony in the murder case against Tim Verrill. This is the second time he goes before a New Hampshire jury because the first trial was declared a mistrial after state police failed to disclose evidence. Yesterday, the jury heard from police who responded to the crime scene. They also heard about 
very gruesome details about that crime scene and details about how Christine Sullivan and Jenna Pellegrini were found dead. During opening statements, prosecutors said the defendant was a paranoid drug dealer high on meth who violently murdered the women because he believed that they were working as police informants. While the defense told the jury, police got the wrong guy. Take a listen. There is no boogeyman. The evidence in this case will show that the defendant is the only one who cleaned up the scene, the only one who fled from the police, and the only one who killed. And at the end of this trial, we'll ask you to return a verdict consistent with that evidence. Guilty. Christine and Jenna fought back against their killers. They fought so hard that their killer's DNA got embedded under their fingernails. That killer's DNA was not Tim's. Tim did not kill Christine and Jenna. Tim was not told to kill Christine or Jenna. And Tim did not have any motive, any incentive, or any reason to kill Christine or Jenna. Now, the defendant has been in custody since his arrest back in 2017, and as you know, faces life behind bars if convicted. Julie? All right, Matt, thank you so much for that update. We'll see you later in Tipping the Scales. Right now, let's turn to Tuesday's big verdict in the Jealous X Trooper murder case, where a jury found defendant Dan Howard guilty. Count one, is the defendant Daniel C. Howard guilty or not guilty of domestic battery? Guilty. Count two, is the defendant, Daniel C. Howard, guilty or not guilty of murder in the first degree? Not guilty. Is the defendant, Daniel Howard, guilty or not guilty of second degree murder? Guilty. So Howard's attorney spoke with Court TV, telling us that he plans to appeal the convictions. So could he possibly be successful? I have two great attorney guests standing by to answer that question for us. They're practicing criminal defense attorneys in the private sector. I have with me Casey Early. She does criminal defense work and civil rights work. And Franz Borghardt, he does criminal defense work and formerly was a prosecutor. Good morning to you both. Casey, let me start with you, please. We saw this guy walk on the first degree murder charge, but convicted on second degree. And I've got to look at what the Idaho law looks like. Uh, pulling that up on your screen here, all murder perpetrated by any kind of willful, deliberate, and premeditated killing is murder of the first degree. All other kinds of murder of the second degree. Uh, so uh, Casey, when we look at what he was actually convicted of here, he's looking at at least 10 years uh, plus much more on, on just that charge. Uh, tell me, does the defense have any leg to stand on on appeal in your opinion? Well, again, it always depends, Julian. Good morning, by the way. Um, and, and I was kind of um, surprised at the first degree murder as opposed to the second degree murder conviction. And for eight hours of deliberation, it could possibly be that the jury was deliberating on that premeditation as opposed to maybe in the heat of the moment. So there, there is a possibility. I mean, there were experts here um, that testified the battle of the experts. So uh, maybe there was evidence that they believe should not have come in uh, based on the judge's ruling. I know that it kind of got heated. Uh, during the trial, and um, there were some disagreements with the judge's rulings based on the objections. So it, it definitely depends on whether or not that, that uh, defense attorney believes that he has a legal basis to file that appeal. Casey, okay, thank you. Franz, to you next, please. Another issue the defense told us about that they plan to attack on appeal is the fact that they wanted the domestic battery charge severed at trial to be tried on a different day in front of a different jury uh, because it happened uh, so remotely in time from the incident in question involving the death of Kendi Howard. Do you think there may be something there? So the number one reason cases get overturned on appeal is because we let other bad acts or other crimes evidence come in. However, this case, I think it's germane and important to the underlying murder case. And look, let me just say this. The defense attorney has to say, hey, we're taking an appeal. But I will tell you deep down inside, this defense attorney, it's a victory that his client didn't get convicted of first degree murder. Yeah. And Jeopardy has now attached. So they're playing with house money now, right? Sure, the defendant, the trooper is like, I don't want to go to jail for a minute. 
and I want to appeal. But I will tell you deep down inside that defense attorney in our world, that is a victory. Anything less than first degree murder in this case is a victory. Franz, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you, you know, for, for keeping it real here. Uh, you know, behind closed doors, it's going to be a different conversation than the one you're going to have with the media, certainly. You know, I, I get it. This guy's being paid to be an advocate. Don't fault him in the least. He's advocating for his client. And the defense did a fine job, might I just say. Uh, he was a tremendous advocate. He had uh, a lot of tough facts to work with. I want to play a clip for you both from the press conference that happened after the jury came to their verdict late last night. This is the district attorney you'll hear speaking, uh, talking about Mr. Howard's arrest at the airport. He was arrested at the airport, but that was because he violated the conditions of his release. He was not allowed to go within two miles of the airport. And so an arrest warrant was issued and he was arrested on that warrant, but the charges were violating his release conditions. There were no for any new criminal offenses. Assuming that you will bring that up during sentencing, correct? It, the, the fact that he was at the airport when he shouldn't have been, the fact that a gun was found in his vehicle, yes, that'll all be brought for the court's attention at sentencing. Mm, okay, Casey, back to you. Let's talk about this airport issue, if we can, please. So this guy's looking at at least 10 years to potentially life in prison. Uh, we're wondering, do you think the incident at the airport could factor into his sentencing? Why or why not, please? Absolutely. He violated the terms of his pretrial release, and he didn't just violate it with, like, let's say, a curfew outside of his house. He's at an airport. There's a gun, and there's no way that ignorance of the law is no excuse. So you can't say, oh, well, I forgot or I didn't know. You knew, Mr. Officer. So this is definitely an aggravating factor that the judge will consider because this is evidence of guilt, evidence of flight. And look at the perfect timing, by the way. This occurred right after the prosecution closed their case. So it looked like they were sticking a nail in his coffin and he was trying to get away. I would consider that if I was a judge in this case. Casey, I love it. I love what you're saying there. You know, and Franz, speaking of what the judge might do with this guy, talk to me about that, please. If you had to, you know, factoring in everything, the airport flight, uh, the domestic violence, uh, all of it, how do you think the judge may land when it comes to an appropriate sentence for Mr. Howard? I think the judge starts from the position that this was a law enforcement officer that has now eroded the public trust in law enforcement officers. So you got to start there, right? And he perpetuated it further, Julie, by not following the rules. He's above the rules. He doesn't follow the rules. So I think he lands with a sizable sentence. Um, I think it's going to be somewhere in the, I, I'm just going to say it, I think he gets 30 plus years. Um, I think it's going to be long enough to where he probably doesn't get out of jail one day. Mm -hmm. All right. I sure hope so. I hope so, Franz. Franz and KC, I'm so glad we have you both on the program. Stand by for more questions, please. we got to hit our first break. When we come back, here's what's trending in true crime. I said there was a blanket found. I think it's a sign of hope to find, find him around here, and I think he's going to be close to this area. It's confirmed Elijah Vu's blanket has been found. So now, what does this mean for the search? And the search for Riley Strain continues this morning in Nashville. Reports are swirling about his last known text message. We are moving closer to trial in the case against doomsday prophet Chad Daybell. Prosecutors say they will seek the death penalty against him. Investigators have recovered human remains at Chad Daybell's residence. There's no way, Lori, I should never come up with this. His wife, Lori Valo Daybell, has already been convicted. Now, will her husband end up with the same fate? It's just so hard to know where the truth ends. It's the doomsday prophet, Chad Daybell, on trial. Now for what's trending in true crime. Police finally have a new clue in the search for missing toddler Elijah Vu. Officials in Wisconsin are confirming that his little red and white blanket was found about four miles from where he was reported missing. This sweet 
three-year-old child was last seen on February 20th at a home in Two Rivers, Wisconsin. His mother, Katrina Bauer, and her boyfriend, Jesse Vang, have since been arrested and charged with child neglect. Now, there are so many people right at this moment trying to find little Elijah that police have to warn searchers not to trespass on private property. So now that it's confirmed that the blanket belongs to him, what are the next steps in this investigation? We have great guests on our power panel this morning. Let's bring them in now. Still with me, criminal defense and civil rights attorney Casia Early, criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor Franz Borkhart, and retired police sergeant with the Nashville Police Department, Melissa Pinkleton. Good morning to you all. Sergeant Pinkleton, I'd like to begin with you, please. Would you start off the conversation and where the search goes from here? Yeah, this is a big deal. This is a big find. Um, it, it, it's sad, but um, big find. They, what they need to do is now that they have a piece of evidence that they know left with the child, they, now is the time to get mom and the boyfriend back in the box and start asking questions again. Because with an actual thing, which an actual product that they found, a piece of clothing that they found, his blanket, that might amp up the anxiety to get one of them to flip over on the other. I mean, that that's a big find because right now they probably are thinking we stick to our story, we stick to our story, we're good. And I don't think that they anticipated this blanket coming up. So this mm -hmm. is a good thing. Also, what they're going to be able to do is get drones in the air, cadaver dogs in the ground and work backwards from the area that they found that blanket. And that's going to be a big deal. And hopefully with a certain certain amount of radius, drones, dogs, searchers and make, getting them back in the box to speak and hopefully flip on one or the other. Exactly, Sergeant. They are not letting up. I've got a clip from the chief of police now saying that they are determined to find Elijah. I'm not going to speculate. What I'm going to do is continue to search for Elijah Vu. We are doing everything in our efforts, believing that he is still out there. We will find him and we will bring him home. Mm, Franz Borghardt, to you next, please. Uh, your thoughts on this investigation and Largely what Sergeant Pinkleton said, we've got these two defendants, they're both behind bars right now. How might investigators lean on them to further the search? Well, I think they are going to put them in a, you know, an interrogation room and say, hey, we know your DNA is all over this blanket. Why don't you tell us what happened? And look, whether or not their DNA is on the blanket or not, police can absolutely tell them that in an effort to get them to to disclose what happened to that little kid. And, and look, at the end of the day, you've got two competing interests that are the same, right? Where is he? Let's find him. And two, how did he get wherever he is? And for me as a citizen, for me as someone who's watching this, I want them in jail because I absolutely believe they had something to do with it. And two, I want to find him so he can be put to rest. Preach, my friend. Preach, Franz. Yes. I've got a clip from Grandma, little Elijah's grandma, speaking out. Let's take a listen to what she's been saying. I want my grandson to be home with my family. So I want everybody to continue. Don't stop. Just searching for my baby Elijah. Mm, Casey, uh, uh, to you next, please. Would you take us home on this case, your thoughts, and whether we'll be finding little Elijah safe? I am believing by faith that they're going to find him. And I do believe that, speaking of DNA, they may find outside DNA, another source of DNA, where if the two won't talk, maybe the third person's DNA, they'll talk. And then, they, as my colleague stated, work backwards from the evidence that you have. They're going to find that baby. They're going to find circumstantial evidence that's going to corner them. And one is going to break. So this is just absolutely heartbreaking but I'm holding out faith that he'll be found and laid to rest. Okay, Sia, well said. Thank you kindly. Let's turn to some other big trending news now. Some scary moments when a teenager pulled a gun out on a Florida beach full of spring breakers. Police were already patrolling that beach when they spotted a fight, and then things escalated quickly. Take a look at the body camera footage. Drop the gun! 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 Dr
My goodness, officers chased the boy down on the beach for several minutes trying to clear the crowds at the same time. Now, this all happened at New Smyrna Beach right near Daytona. The 16-year-old finally surrendered. Thank goodness nobody was hurt. He is facing multiple charges, though, this morning, and this really could have ended a lot worse, right? So this morning, we're asking the question, did police handle this appropriately? Sergeant Melissa Pinkleton, want to start with you, please. Absolutely. The police did a great job on this because the, because the situation with so many bystanders, luckily this kid who's 16, this criminal, uh, did not fire at the police because unfortunately when it first came off and first jumped off, the police would not have been in a position to fire back because there were so many innocent civilians, they would not have been able to fire back because of the chance that a stray bullet would have hit one of them. So they did a really good job of chasing the kid down, staying on him, getting the crowd out of the way, getting all of that backed up so that if they perhaps had to have a shootout, they were in a much better position. They would have been able to do so uh, in a much safer way. And luckily for the police, he ran into the water. So we had a clean backdrop on him at that point. So police one, bad guy zero. That's right, Sarge. I love how you said that. Uh, bravo to these officers. Uh, they deserve a world of credit keeping everybody safe here. And uh, Franz and Casey, oh boy, this kid needs a good criminal defense attorney. I want to put something up on the screen for you both to look at because he didn't just take his flip-flops and his beach towel to the beach. No. Police said he had all of this, these individual bags of marijuana and a gun with him. So he needs to call uh, you, Casey, you're in Florida uh, where this happened. Uh, let me start with you, please. Uh, your thoughts. Oh, yeah. Listen, J Julie, spring break is a rite of passage. It's for college students who have worked all year long to just take that break. It's the knuckleheads. And in this case, it was this gen gentleman who not only brought a gun to the beach, but all of this paraphernalia. He, he's going to have so many charges. And we have a saying here in Florida, you come on vacation and you leave on probation. So he definitely <laughs> needs a lawyer. But for the rest of us, can we just have a cool, chill spring break? I mean, really. <laughs> right. You come on vacation, you leave on probation. Casey, I love it. Uh, seriously, he needs to call you. Franz Borger, take us home. Uh, you know, when prosecutors get a hold of this guy, you know, he's a teen. Teenager, uh, what do you think they may do with him, please? Well, he's lucky to be alive. That's number one. Number two is we got to figure out what's going on, right? Large quantity of drugs, smells uh, of drug dealing in this instance, and maybe not drug using, but I don't exclude that possibility. Drugs and gun, that's that's a no-no, right? We don't like the, that combo. I think we got to get to the heart of what's going on with him. Um, we're using the term criminal. But remember, for juveniles, unless he's tried and handled as an adult, we, we use the word delinquent. It's a delinquent act, right? Doesn't mean he can't be held accountable, but we gotta make that distinction. Does he get held as a, a, accountable as a juvenile or as an adult? And why in the world is he doing these things so that we can do what? Set things in motions to stop him from doing it again. Amen. Uh, Franz, you're right. We'll see if he is found delinquent. You're absolutely right. If he's adjudicated delinquent, that is usually the terms that we hear, or if uh, if he winds up in adult court. I have a feeling they'll keep him in juvenile court for this. Uh, hopefully he shapes up. Franz Borghard, thank you for everything. we got to say goodbye to you, let you get off to court. We'll see you soon. Casia and Melissa are coming along with us. Here's what's next here on Opening Statements. We know that Riley was possibly texting and communicating with multiple people. Again, we don't know the exact people. We don't know the exact timeline. We've got the latest on the search for missing University of Missouri student Riley Strain. There are reports swirling this morning about his last known text message. We'll talk about it next and a preview of today's big motions hearing for homicide defendant Karen Reed. Welcome back to Opening Statements. This morning, we're shining our spotlight on the ongoing search efforts for missing college student Riley Strain. He vanished two weeks ago after a night out with his fraternity brothers in Nashville, Tennessee. He was last seen on camera near the Cumberland River. And on Tuesday, his parents held a press conference asking the public for help and expressing how hard this has been on them and on Riley's friends. 
just as hard on them as it is on us. And right Let's, now, we, we, we really are focusing, focusing on... Focusing on bringing Riley home. His last point. He's my best friend. He's everything. Let's talk about this case. I have three great, great guests standing by with me right now. Retired police sergeant with the Nashville Police Department, Melissa Pinkleton, criminologist, author, and professor at St. Thomas University, Dr. Debbie Goodman, and executive producer and entertainment host of the Pascal Show, Pascal Bobuff. Good morning to you all. Thank you for being with us. Sergeant Pinkleton, let me start with you, please. Riley Strain's parents are saying that the police aren't doing enough. What's your reaction to that? As a parent, I absolutely can, I can feel how they would feel that way. I, I, I absolutely can understand how they feel that way. Um, what they, it's hard to separate the emotion from the logical things that have to be done for them, which again, very understandable. But the police are actually, they're really doing everything they can with all the resources that they have. They have combed through uh, so much video footage. If you think about it, cell phone footage, um, businesses footage from them, there's hours upon hours to comb through. And although we have a time frame, which narrows it down a lot, we have many, many locations within that time frame. And then to break that down even further, within that time frame, something of interest, they have to break that footage down and go even further from there. And so it's 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 a it's an insurmountable thought the amount of information that only several only a small unit is able to work with because while this is going on it's not that they don't want to have every single use resource to this investigation there are also other crimes and investigations happening in Nashville at the same time so they have deployed drones they have deployed dogs they have um, urban search and rescue they've had volunteer search and rescue and they have not let up let me tell you from being here in Nashville, it is 24 seven. This is still the thing that's top of the hour all day, every day. So um, while, I, while I understand how she is feeling as a mama, um, the resources that are being deployed and used uh, all day along and all night, every day here, they, they are still going really hard all day. Sergeant Pingleton, thank you for that. Dr. Debbie Goodman, I wanna to turn to you next, please. You are an expert in criminology and based on these facts, I'm curious if you believe that something criminal happened to Riley Strain. Well, good morning, Julie, and always a pleasure to join you. What I believe is that there is some um, potential here for a drug component. When we look, Julie, at the decorum, the demeanor, we see him on the surveillance, something just simply is not right. So when something doesn't look right, sound right, feel right, we have to look at all options. Let's talk about what we know. Here's what we know. It's the month of March, and we know that we have nearly 1 million college and university students between the ages of 18 and 24 who are traveling to various locations within the United States, traveling abroad. Here's also what we know, information from the CDC, our Center for Disease Control, WHO, our World Health Organization, points to an uptick, Julie, unfortunately, in what we refer to as club drugs. So that would be categories such as methamphetamine, um, fentanyl, ecstasy, the psilocybins. These are the hallucinogenic drugs. So whether a drug was ingested willfully and or against one's will, I think potentially these are the conversations that families need to be having with their loved ones about safety, security, and survival. Most definitely excellent insight as always, Dr. Debbie. Thank you for that. According to a friend, we know Riley Strain last texted a girl that he was seeing. Uh, she texted him to see how he was doing, if he was having fun. He sent kind of a scripted text back to her saying, and we're quoting directly, good lops, L-O-P-S. And, and this was uh, conveyed by Riley's good friend, Chris Dingman, who's been doing some media interviews on Monday. One of those interviews was to our guest this morning, Pascal Bo. Buff. Uh, Pascal, to you next, please. When you were talking with Riley Strain's friend, Chris, did he share any insight on what he thought that text message might have meant? He honestly said, and, and good morning to everybody as well, honored to be here. Um, he honestly just said that he doesn't really know what it means. I feel like I feel like he was giving off the vibe that is kind of a dead end type of text. I think it was just a misspell text. He could have been saying lulls 
maybe lost, but I don't think it was anything cryptic. Uh, definitely not low on power. Sorry. He even said that too. He's like, I even corresponded with the girl that he was texting with. And he's like, she even had to Google it to see what it could possibly mean. So that should also kind of explain that, that particular text to begin with. Sure, Pascal. So he didn't seem to want to put too much weight on it, huh? That really wasn't where he no. feels like the focus should be. No. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Sergeant Pinkleton, back to you, please. Uh, we have a clip where Riley Strain encountered a police officer on the street. We've been watching that body camera footage again and again. Let's take a look at it together now. How you doing, sir? I'm good. How are you? Good. Uh, Sergeant, you know this area well. Uh, what's the crime activity like in this area where Riley Strain was last seen? So because this was um, a late night, this was a party weekend, the crime in that area is pretty high, especially spring break that time of year. Um, you have your a lot of homeless people in that area, a lot of homeless people. So you have your vandalism, your minor theft, your petty theft, your... Um, your trespassers, but you have your car burglaries. And without knowing what that officer was doing there, what I can tell you is for some reason, that red truck caught his eye and he was more so looking into that truck to see what was going on. And I, Riley popped over on the side going parallel with the river, as I see. And the officer was just kind of, that's his way of scanning the area. He saw Riley and then was like, how, how you doing? Just to be kind and because they're very tourist friendly in Nashville as they should be and have him go by. But you know, there's a lot of theories floating around. The main one that seems to be sticking though is that it is believed that he possibly fell in the river because his activity going towards the river and now you see him paralleling the river there in the officer's body cam. And so that that is still a big belief here or if he was possibly maybe mugged and put in the river. We don't know. We're hoping to find him safe and sound, but right now they're still working with the river theory. Mm -hmm. Right, Sergeant. And, and it is a, a very plausible theory. I appreciate you bringing that up, and let's not forget that. Uh, Pascal, back to you, please. Uh, in gathering information about what witnesses might have seen, we know there, there were two homeless camps uh, where Riley Strain passed by. There were witnesses that saw him. Do you think there could be any clues with any of of those people who might have seen him in the final minutes at the riverbank when his phone last pinged. I think absolutely. I mean, there's been eyewitnesses making accounts of hearing some sort of commotion just up where his last ping was, saying that someone called back down, saying, oh, yeah, he's okay, he's fine, he's just drunk. And then they went off and did, you know, carried on with the rest of their night. Um, Absolutely, I, I really do believe that there's been also other accounts of another man, another homeless man allegedly wearing his shirt. There's been claims in, uh, about that within uh, Old Tent City as well. Um, some other people that have seen this homeless man wearing his shirt. Um, so yeah, there's been so many pieces of information that have been uh, given from Old Tent City, from other eyewitnesses as well that, yeah, it. It feels like there should have, there could have been some real commotion going on, and I'm wondering, where did he go? What happened here? Mm -hmm. Right, Pascal. Absolutely, uh, Dr. Debbie Goodman I would love for you to take us home uh, on this discussion, please. I have a clip I'd like to play for you. This is David Flagg. He's the National Director of Operations for the United Cajun Navy. Uh, let's take a listen to what he's saying about no foul play suspected. At this point. There is no evidence that I'm aware of that would indicate foul play. You know, you all know how it goes on Facebook and social media. There's been a lot of uh, chatter on there about the fact that uh, Riley's debit card was found on the riverbank and that that is uh, prima facie evidence of criminal activity, something of that nature there. I don't agree with that. Dr. Debbie, wondering if, if you feel that what you're hearing, you know, from and he's not the first official to say it about no foul play suspected at this point, supports your theory about potential drugging even further. Right. I would still maintain, Julie, there's nothing yet that I see that really points the red flag in the direction of foul play. I really think, unfortunately, whether there was 
willful participation in a narcotic or perhaps, and very likely so, it was um, given against one's will and knowledge, but yet it may have had this impact both mentally and physically on, on Riley's ability to function well. And I do agree with Melissa. I'm also leaning toward a theory that potentially he may have made his way toward the river, toward the lake, and um, we should look there. Right, right, Dr. Debbie, I, I'm with you. I was giving my opening statement about it the other day. Uh, it's very sad, and we hope, we all hope for the best for Riley Strain and his family. I think everyone would want nothing more uh, to have his safe return. Uh, but uh, being realistic and looking at all the facts and his last known location, the inebriation, it does not look good. We have to leave it there for now, but this was a really meaningful discussion. Thank you all, Sergeant Melissa Pingleton, Dr. Debbie Goodman, and Pascal Bobuff. Great to have you all on this story. Thank you kindly. We'll see you soon. When we come back, defendant Karen Reed's defense team wants to access some phone records of witnesses in the case. There's a hearing on it Today, we'll talk about what is tipping the scales of justice. Drug ring, a double murder, and deadly secrets in a small town. Prosecutors allege Timothy Vero killed two women because he believed they were working as police informants. The Small Town Secrets Murder Trial, today on Court TV. There's no way, Morgan, I can ever come up with this. We're moving closer to the trial in the case against Chad Daybell. Prosecutors say they will seek the death penalty. It's the doomsday prophet, Chad Daybell, on trial. Karen, just to be clear, you didn't do it. We know who did it, Steve. We know. And we know who spearheaded this cover-up. You all know. Yes, we do. Do we? Now, let's talk about what's tipping the scales of justice in the case of defendant Karen Reed. The Boston woman is accused of killing her police officer boyfriend, John O'Keefe, and she's set to be in court today for a motions hearing. Now, her defense team wants some access to some third-party phone records. If you hear... Rule 17 thrown out in the courtroom, that's the rule that governs that, you know, because we can't just be taking people's phone records. There has to be a good reason for it. And the prosecution is saying that there isn't. They're saying that the defense team here is on a, quote, fishing expedition. There is no suggestion of a third party culprit, no suggestion of cover up of evidence, no suggestion uh, from the 13 civilians uh, witnesses testimony that we've received uh, or transcripts of that testimony. All of them confirmed that Mr. O'Keefe never entered 34 Fairview Road. All of it uh, was absolutely no animosity between the individuals at the Waterfall Bar or at 34 Fairview residence. There was no fight. There was no dog attack. There was no eyewitness to the circumstances that led to Mr. O'Keefe's death. All right, that was the prosecution at last week's hearing. So let's break down more of what the prosecution is saying in response to the defense's motion to get these cell phone records. Because remember, this is the defense team was asking for it, and the state has a response. So I combed through their filing, and I pulled out a couple points for our discussion today. And unfortunately, we can't get to it all, but just want to hit some highlights here. I want to bring in, to help me out with this, Court TV crime and justice correspondent Matt Johnson in the studio, and criminal defense and civil rights attorney Casey Early, who is standing by remotely for us. So we know that Matt, Jennifer McCabe, who mm -hmm. is a, a, was a friend of John O'Keefe's, uh, which I think is really important to know. She only knows Karen Reed through John O'Keefe, um, is going to be a big witness, and she has been the subject of a lot of discussions. Um, tell me a little bit about the biggest thing the defense wants out of of, of, of her. Well, really, they're trying to explain these relationships for their theory of collusion and for a cover up. But you have the defense that is really trying to get her phone records and other people's phone records because they want to show transparency. And sure, some relationships were not disclosed, but um, if they're going to cooperate and hand over their phones right away, what does that tell you? Right. Well, and it's interesting you make that point because I was stunned when I read this and Jennifer McCabe was happy to turn over her phone for a download immediately. Okay, I'm looking at this bottom of page seven on the motion. 
Prior to Ms. Bikem entering their home and waking them up in their bedroom, her cell phone, which was downloaded by members of the Massachusetts State Police following her signed consent, shows calls from her phone to both Nicole and Brian Albert's phones, evidencing she was not part of a cover up. So this is huge. When they try to make her seem like she's some disingenuous witness, this is someone who was woken up in the middle of the night by Karen Reed. Karen Reed had John O'Keefe's niece call her and say, please wake up. Karen Reed was hysterical, said, can I come to your house? Um, so that's one big thing. Um, now, let's talk about something else that happened when Karen Reed was home at John O'Keefe's house because remember she was living at his house and KC I want to bring you in on this this was something I had no idea about till I read the Commonwealth's motion but John O'Keefe had ring doorbell video uh, two different ring cameras set up on the house and there's missing video from when Karen Reed dropped him off at the party and then when she left at 5.08 a.m. to go to Jennifer McCabe's house after she woke Jennifer up and said, you gotta help me find John, where is that video? So this motion talks about how the niece and the nephew of John O'Keefe were both interviewed and said we had no access to it, but Karen Reed did. So the state is insinuating that she got rid of this evidence. Uh, Casey, what do you think about that? Yeah, the state is hidden back. I mean, this has been zealous advocacy on behalf of Ms. Reed. I mean, the defense have been combing through so much evidence. And then after they received the evidence from the prosecution, they filed motions stating that we're missing additional evidence. And in this case, um, they're asking the court to get additional witnesses access to their cell phone records because they believe that there is some type of communication or relationship between the officers and the witnesses. So the prosecution, they're not just standing and taking these punches. And that is a question that the court will uh, need to resolve because it, it shows that either she tampered with possible evidence in this case, and maybe she's not as innocent as the public may seem, and which is kind of weird because typically when you see defendants accused of murder in the court of public opinion, they're usually the ones that are not supported. So uh, this is definitely going to play out, but I do believe they should get access to the witnesses statements. Mm -hmm. All right, Casey. Oh, okay, and Matt, uh, you had a point. Yeah, there. you know, I think that Casey is making the perfect point here. You know, again, we don't have a horse in the race, right? right. You know, good point. But, but, Doesn't change our lives in any way, shape or form. What happens but with you this have case? the this case in the court of public opinion because you have those protesters and the people cheering for Karen Reed and the um, optics of all of this and Casey is exactly right because this is the first time in these huge motions that you and I have read um, that we're getting more details about that grand jury indictment that led to right. these charges after 42 witnesses and 14 days right Matt right it's almost like the public got this backwards because the defense team and kudos to them kudos to them they wanted to kick this case before trial and so they made every effort to try to convince the public of their narrative so we're getting more but facts now. the state, oh yeah, tons of facts. Read up, people, read up. I'm telling you, everybody at home who's curious about this case, look at these motions. I've got one more, a big nugget I was totally unaware of till I read this on page 22. Uh, Karen Reed goes back to the crime scene before going to Jennifer McCabe's home, according to the Commonwealth. So they have her on video at 5.08 a.m. leaving John O'Keefe's house. And then at 5.30, they know that's when she arrived at Jennifer McCabe's house. Carrie Roberts, John O'Keefe's other friend joined them, and they all three drove over to the home uh, that's located on, um, I believe it is Fairview, Fairview. Uh, Avenue, where the Alberts lived. So there's that period of time between 5.08 and 5.30 where there are cameras in the vicinity that see her Lexus SUV, and they check her phone records, and it lines <coughs> up that she went back to that area. Why? Matt, finally. Well, I think that this is going to prove um, conscience of guilt for Commonwealth, but pros or defense is going to say, is it her car? There you go. We'll leave it there for now. There's so much more. I told you we couldn't get to it all. Acacia Early, thank you so much. Matt Johnson, thank you. Again, that hearing happening today. We'll go there live together when it begins. That's all for this episode of Opening Statements, my friends. When we come back, we're going to bring you up to speed on Tuesday's highlights in the Small Town Secrets murder trial.